All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I'll be your moderator. We're excited to welcome Dr. Jonathan Levine as our speaker today, as he will share how to create stunning visuals that power cosmetic case acceptance. Dr. Levine practices in New York and offers a comprehensive approach to dentistry, intersecting beauty, function, and health. Before we get started, we've got a couple of reminders for you. At any point during tonight's webinar, we do encourage your participation through the chat and Q&A features. Please type any questions you might have into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll answer them live at the end of the presentation. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Levine, I will throw it over to you. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you to uh, Henry Schein webinar series. Uh, thank you, Gary Severance, Andrea Kloss, and the whole uh, Henry Schein educational team. Uh, pleasure to speak to you tonight. Um, I am uh, talking about wow. And wow comes out of the effect when we excite our patient. And when we excite our patients, hopefully that's what we hear from them. So what I wanna talk about tonight is how to create these stunning visuals that will excite our patients that power these aesthetic case acceptance. So I live in a world of um, kind of three decades later of my practice that I've always loved and is always my center of the universe. Practice the same way uh, two days a week for the last 21 years. I've been able to, uh, with, with the help of wonderful people, and we say we are the company we keep uh, to build a company called Glow Science, and we have a wonderful team there. And then I'm very involved both on the uh, university level of my alma mater, Boston University. I was fortunate to be chairman of the advisory board and NYU, very fortunate to be invited into the advanced aesthetics program about 16 years ago by Steve Chu. And involved with that was a uh, past program director now taken over by a wonderful prosthodontist, Mike Galizio, and my partner in crime, Dr. Jeff McClendon. We, I've also been able to start a foundation called the Glow Good Foundation. I show you my worlds because it all ties in together and it helps reinforce my belief that everyone deserves to feel the power of a beautiful, healthy smile. So let me just give you a little bit of the world that I have lived in on the public facing side of, of things. The best of the best. A colleague and friend, dentist Jonathan Levine. Hey Jonathan, how are you? America's smile expert. Dentists are the stars. With us now to talk about how important it is to keep your mouth healthy is oral health expert, Dr. Jonathan Levine. He is the program director of advanced aesthetics at NYU School of Dentistry. Easiest things in dentistry is tooth whitening. That'll take 10 years off of somebody's life. Because of my diabetes, I lost all but five of my teeth. So I have called my dentist and he has agreed to give you a brand new smile, the smile that you deserve. You ready? Come take a look. Oh my God. Friend and colleague, Dr. Jonathan Levine, gave you a new smile. Oh my God, let me, he's let, my new Let me see friend. a smile. I well. love him. My name is Karen, I'm 50 years old, and I haven't smiled a complete smile in about 25 years. My teeth are gray and brown. I also have a gap between my teeth and an overbite. And that's, that's the vision from before. And now, with a new smile, Karen, come on out. Yeah, come over and compare that. I mean, it's just amazing. I'm going to smile all the time and not be embarrassed anymore. Wow, we could do a whole hour yeah, on this. Very good. Have to come back. Keep smiling, Dr. Mm -hmm. Levine. <laughs> Nobody should be afraid to smile. Well, I show you that because, and in fact, don't believe any of it, but I really show it to you because it, it reflects what we do as a profession because we have a choice. We could live in a land that we just think about surviving in our profession, but we really could live in a land that's exciting, where we can really power through it and thrive in our profession. And for me, I've been able to learn over the decades from fantastic people like Peter Dawson, when I did my prosthodontic program, the, the wonderful people there, my friend Christian Coachman, who turned me on to much of the digital workflow, uh, interdisciplinary giant named Rick Robley, who wrote the book in the late 90s, Dennis Tarnow from my program, and we all know 
uh, Dennis Tarnow and Frank Spear. And on the shoulders of these people, I'm going to present to you kind of the work after multiple decades of how we think about the patient experience. Let's start. Here's my team. I can't do anything without an amazing team. We have about 26 people, digital technicians, ceramists. In the middle there, there's Dr. Jeff McClendon, who uh, helped write the textbook that I'm going to show you. And it's a team of very committed professionals. And we say we're an overnight success in 25 years. That's the truth. Because every day we say we want to get a little bit better. I'm a cyclist and we say one pedal stroke at a time. Every day we try to improve and get better and to learn. Let me show you a little bit about the patient experience in our dental practice. And I want to show you our practice today. Let's think about that patient experience, what they see when they walk in, how they're greeted, what kind of technology we have. We have the ceramists that are on the second floor, two amazing ceramists been with us for 24 years. And we're able to show the patient where they are, we identify where they are, and then we want to show them where we can take them where we can take them, where we can visualize the future design with them. So using digital photography, using scans. Today we use a, a process called digital smile design originated by Dr. Christian Coachman over seven, eight years ago. Now it's a company called DSD, Digital Smile Design, check them out. And there's the before and afters. And we use video, and we use stills to really show our patients and excite them, not hold the mirror up, but to really show their image. Because remember, it's just a plastic mock-up from a design. We'll show, we'll, we'll talk further. So the patient experience, what they're gonna experience when they call on the phone, when they walk in the door, we give a lot of thought to that. The truth is today, Dentistry is a platform for innovation. There is so much great innovation coming out of our industry. The young people who have great ideas, there's this support that's coming from the venture capital people with ideas and invention. And for us in dentistry, it's a new day because of the efficiencies that digital dentistry affords. And we say digital dentistry will make you a great dentist. The fundamentals have to be learned and developed but digital dentistry will make us efficient, effective, and the ability to copy natural tooth form is truly amazing. So think about what you do, what do you do? And here's our choice. We can get in this land of fix me dentistry or we can be transformational smiles. Come on. Maria, I just met a girl named Maria. No teeth. Maria. I just met a girl named Maria. Oh, I can do it. She's here. You know what? You oh, yeah, where is better. she? Mock up in the mouth. And suddenly, <laughs> Maria. Of course, he sounds better. Of course, phonetically, he sounds better because now he has an incisal ledge, an incisal ledge position, and phonetically correct. This is what we do, this is what we can do. So what I wanna talk about is this option that we have in dentistry, and this was years ago, Fix Me Dentistry, but today it's all about giving the patient what they want. We need to give them a healthy, beautiful smile, and we are the smile experts to do so. So what we're gonna talk about in the next 45 minutes, the learning objectives, we're gonna look at what's happening in dentistry today. It's a digital revolution driven a lot in aesthetics by the ability to, to design smiles and to create incredible wow moments for our patients through this process that we call the motivational maca. We can live in an analog world, we can learn all these new things and live in a digital world, and we can live in both. Either one works, it's our choice, supported by our knowledge, our fundamentals, and our mindset to constantly improve what we do. We're gonna look at how we integrate aesthetics and function. My partner in crime, Dr. Jeff McClendon, we've been together 25 years. He's very occlusion, occlusion focused. I'm very aesthetic focused. And over the last decades, we've come together with a concept we like to call the feline that we teach in our program at NYU. 
the three-step analysis, which is really just a kind of a new version of what Pete ta Dawson always has taught. If you can identify where you are, if you know where you want to go, Pete Dawson would always say, getting there is easy. You're the giant of restorative and aesthetic dentistry. What came out of learnings that I did early on from Panky Man and, and Pete Dawson was developing an aesthetic evaluation form. And I'll show you that, but its ability to move easily to identify the problems, the important things in a checklist. And I'll show you how we look at the motivational mock-up and we get our patient to wow. So we're living in this digital revolution. That is absolutely the truth. We all know it. And we have this option to dive into it, get ourselves out of this comfort zone and press ourselves to get into an uncomfortable zone, to learn and to do things that are new as we move from analog to digital. For the young professionals on this and listening to this, you are the future. You are the people who are going to move this new technology forward. And this is the ability to maximize what we do, both from an aesthetic standpoint and a functional standpoint. Let's compare. Let's compare the analog world to the digital world. We lived for the last 20, 25 years, I think of Dr. Lloyd Miller at the Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry in the late 90s, talking about facially generated treatment plan. But in the digital world, as we look at the face and the ability to design on a computer and to look at all of these elements, it's much easier to do it. So we have facially driven smile design from the computer that we 3D print. Our communication is greatly enhanced today. We know that because of all of our digital revolution, we have a digital workflow flow from scanning, then designing to manufacturing, whether it's aligners, whether it's CAD CAM, or whether it's smile design. We integrate natural tooth forms so easily in digital versus a technician sitting and waxing and using their imagination and their knowledge. Now take that knowledge, we can copy uh, exact digital tooth form. A daughter can give their natural tooth form to their mom if she had an accident and to have the exact same tooth shape, tooth position just by scanning and designing and using the different softwares that we have available for, for creating these rest restorations uh, like ExoCAD and Fleece and digital smile design software. That is called the smile donator. So our decision-making process of the analog world is greatly enhanced by this digital world. The traditional dentist, what we used to give them between photography and all this layering and an analog communication and a lack of great interdisciplinary dentistry unless the old specialists were together on one roof is now changed and improved. We have such a great transfer of information, 3D design of natural tooth form, our online communication is seamless and we can develop this interdisciplinary treatment planning uh, like like nowhere before. It's such a great improvement and great changes in this evolution. So scanning, designing, and manufacturing is exactly what happens in this digital world where we have these virtual articulators. We can create smile design and occlusion all digitally. Now, for us, with our dental technicians in-house, we work together and collaboratively. But if they're not in-house, what do you do? And what we do is we choose our, our people. We are the company we keep. We choose our team to match the needs that we have and you grow together. And to the young dentist, you develop these relationships and over time, you see if there's an alignment and a matchup of your value system that you can grow together and become the best versions of what you can be, the best versions of yourself. So this transdisciplinary approach, and this was from the literally the mid nineties from Rick Robley, who's an amazing, amazing orthodontist working in Fayetteville, Arkansas and a, and a colleague and a wonderful person talked about how the disciplines would work together. And today more than ever, because of our digital dentistry, it's so much easier where the restorative dentist who helps architect the design of the occlusion and the aesthetics where the incisal edge goes and the curve of and Wilson works well, you bring all the specialists together to get to that visualized solution. And we have this interdisciplinary approach we like to call across the disciplines, transdisciplinary. So there's a paradigm shift here because of digital dentistry. 
The bottom line is we have to know our fundamentals. So let's look at our philosophy of practice. If you break it down into component pieces, there's a structure and an anatomical harmony that has to, has to happen in the posterior determinants in the TMJ and the whole oral facial area. Then there's a functional harmony that has to happen from an occlusal standpoint, and then a biological harmony that has to happen from a periodontal and a periodontium and support of the mouth. So when you, when you think about a philosophy of practice and the breakdown of the mouth, the breakdown happens when we're not controlling stress and we're not controlling plaque. And so as we think about our philosophy of practice and we think about how we communicate to our patients and how we diagnose, these three points are paramount in our thinking because it, it really sets the stage of structure, function, and biology. So when you think of this structure, function, function, function and biology, you say to yourself, where do aesthetics come in? So we wrote this book about three years ago now, um, published by Elsevier. I, I was fortunate enough to be the editor, and we wrote uh, three, four chapters together. Dr. McClendon and myself, Dr. Frank Salenza did a chapter on aligners. Newton Cardozo from Brazil did a, a wonderful chapter on the beginning world of, of digital dentistry and, and freehand bonding. And um, if you want to take a deeper dive of what I'm talking about, you can get this book uh, on Amazon. So when we think of structure, function, and biology, we all learn that in dental school, but we always put that first. But if you think about what Frank Spear talked about 20, 25 years ago, and I couldn't agree with him more as he was bringing this thinking forward, we say, let's start with aesthetics. Let's determine where the incisal the edge of the, of, the, of the smile goes, and then work backwards from that, and then go after structure, function, and biology, because that's truly what the patient wants, usually is aesthetics. So we don't discount structure and function biology, but we start with the aesthetics in mind. And those are the supporting chapters. That's from Rufinock's book by Chevelle, a classic book on fundamentals of aesthetics. So the feline, F stands for functional, E stands for aesthetic, and the other E stands for edge. So if we think of the aesthetic surface as the facial surface, and we think of the incisal edge as the phonetic edge and the incisal edge position and the pallor surfaces for the function, it's really where all three of these merge together. And if you think about the most important tooth in the smile that has stood the test of time, it's the maxillary central incisor because the edge of the central incisor links these three components of a facial aesthetics, incisal edge phonetics, and palatal surface occlusion. When we think about the position of the teeth, we think about overbite overjet relationship or the biological model. So when we think about cases and patients who have lost vertical dimension, worn down their teeth, and we don't have a place to start, we start here. We want to bring the teeth into this kind of alignment. So overbite overjet creates our anterior coupling. And then we set our posterior teeth into the posterior verticalizing contacts that support the anterior teeth. That describes mutually protected occlusion where the front teeth protects the back teeth and the back teeth protects the front teeth. So when you disassemble occlusion, it's really not that confusing. We have to get a proper vertical dimension so the patients can phonetically speak well and we can create a, a proper relationship of overbite, overjet. We go deeply in this, into this. There's many great chapters uh, in books from functional occlusion of Dawson to Rufinox book uh, on fundamentals of aesthetics uh, to a number of great tech, textbooks. And we've learned from the people for, uh, before us in our book of the integration of aesthetics and occlusion. So a new way of thinking, we say, is let's aesthetics drive our diagnosis. Start with aesthetics first, build a system for aesthetic predictability. So let's jump into this a little bit. We like to take a systematic approach. So we identify the problem. So we got to know where we are. We want to visualize the solution. We want to see that three-dimensionally, where are we going? And then once we know where we're going, we say future back or end in mind, and we then build the most appropriate technique based on that visualized solution. And in fact, when you think about the most appropriate technique, what we think about, we think about the min most minimally invasive, most, invasive, most 
conservative technique. And that's when we use all of our knowledge and all of our techniques to solve the problems. We don't use one technique to solve the problems. In one, for one patient, we might be doing tooth whitening, a little bit of bonding, ceramic veneers and some crowns and one or two implants. So we use all of our techniques to get to that visualized solution. Let's ask ourselves how we do this. And how we do this is we take a three-step analysis. Now remember with diagnosis, and unfortunately, we oftentimes don't spend enough, on di enough time on diagnosis. So borrow a line from the uh, business entrepreneur, Les Wexley, and he says, move slow to go fast. Move slow to go fast. If we remember anything from this presentation, please remember that. Because our diagnosis, and what I've spent my career on, is spending time up front to creatively solve the problems for our patients, to sit back and to think about how do we identify the problems, how do we gather all that important information, and then how do we think what is the best visualized solution for the patient based on what they tell us so we match it together. Well, the system that we like to use is both a three steps. It's called the aesthetic evaluation form, which I'm going to go over. Then we visualize using that information either with an analog approach, which is great. That's a diagnostic waxer for our patients off of mounted models, or we do it digitally. And I'll show you what that's all about. And now we're, we want to show the patient what that looks like. You can take your wax up, index it, and place that in the mouth. Or you can take your design off the computer, which uses natural tooth pull form and a great approach to facial aesthetics. Print that design from a, either a digital smile design software and a number of other softwares. Print that, then index it, place that index in the mouth with, with composite resin, self-cured. And now let's use the system to build the wow. So I'll show you all about how we do that. So here we go. We identify the problem. We remember this three-step analysis, aesthetic evaluation. We, we gather our records, and then we use the aesthetic evaluation form. This form is a checklist. We developed it 25 years ago. It's on its about seventh or eighth iteration. We feel very strong about this. When uh, I was at NYU as the program director, we still use it. And we, in fact, took an iteration of this, and the whole dental school at NYU uses this this form and we've made some changes for the pre-doctoral students. Let's focus on it because it's like a camera zooming in with a checklist to get to the point of where is the gum line on the sexual incisor and where's the incisor leg. Because based on facial aesthetics, now we know everything. If we know how much tooth exposure we want to show with the lipid rest, if we understand if the patient has a high smile line or a low smile line, in other words, the vertical and the horizontal components of the smile, we really have the beginnings to start a diagnostic wax up and to test that concept into the patient's mouth. So the most important things is to ask the questions. And when we ask questions, they're effective questions, meaning they're open-ended because if you ask your patient the right question, not a yes or no, do you like your smile? But if you could change your smile, what would it be? You sit back and don't say a word. We say, Listen 80% of the time and talk 20% of the time. And the patient will tell us everything what's bothering them, whether it's the shape, the shade, the color. And I'll show you how important that early interview is. Then we'd look at the categories of our patient. Our patients fall into two categories, straight, white, perfect, or clean, healthy, natural. I have pictures of both smiles, two actresses. And then they say, oh, I don't really want clean, healthy, natural. I don't want them so perfect. I kind of want them, that's right, white and natural, kind of in the middle. So we give them that option and we break down, down the two categories to three categories. It's very important to know because it'll drive the naturalness of the design, offsets, lateral rotation, setbacks, incisal edge contour, a lot of texture versus more of the perfection and perfect symmetry of a smile. So we ask those questions. We now look at facial aesthetics. We do a lot of work around the oral facial region today. Look at upper lip length, to look at the lip anatomy, to look at a possible asymmetries. You get in front of the patient. You can't do this laying down. You're getting in front of the patient and you're doing a proper facial analysis. 
into pupillary line, lips at rest. Are the lips thin or are they full? Is there asymmetry? Is the upper lip subnasally inferior border of the lip? Is it 18 to 22 millimeters as, as described by Bill Ornette in Six Keys of Occlusion? Or is it 24, 25 millimeters, they're long upper lip? And what can we do about that? Because we have to make big teeth then. Yes, I want to show you that. So we have an aesthetic evaluation form. The most important thing facially is looking at the upper lip with the amount of tooth exposure because we know when our patients are talking and the lips at rest and they don't see anything and you're looking at a darkness in the mouth, it ages the person. The other very important view is the profile view. And if you look at the profile view, that nasolabial angle and rickets e-plane, that line from the tip of the nose to the tip of the chin, where are those lips in relationship? If they're set back and it's a concave profile, we want to bring out this. If it's a convex profile with the lips close to that rickets e-plane, well, we have to downsize and downsize this. And it's a good general rule as described by Lloyd Mill in the late 90s. And now through digital dentistry and the work of Dr. Christian Coachman and his colleagues, this facially generated treatment planning has really worked its way in, in, into our thinking, especially with the work of Frank Spear and, and the Educational Spear Institute that has done such an amazing job over the last 25 years. So in dental facial analysis, we now want to look at the camera zooming in from the face now to the lips and the teeth. Facial, dental, facial, dental, where are the teeth in relationship to the lips? Is it a high smile, wide smile, incisal the ledge, follows the lower lip? And this is all very detailed in the book, midline, midline position, skewing and canting. And then we have all these microesthetic elements we also look at to help our ceramists and our technicians on the waxer. But the most important thing is really to figure out where is the incisal edge of the central incisor. And all this information rolls up to that. The big tool that you want to use here is a digital caliper because you're going to measure ideally where you want to put the gingival margin and the incisal edge. And using flowables right then and there at that first appointment when we move the patient into the treatment room from the time when we ask the important questions and build rapport in a nice quiet area like a private office, now you information gather. We use these flowables to then determine what we're thinking, measuring, and looking at the lip and putting that information in because that's going to help drive either the analog wax up or the digital wax up. Terrific. So let's keep going. And there you go, some microstatic elements. And we look at occlusion. This is all in the book. These are the microstatic elements. And then we're looking now is where are we putting the gum line, right? Or where are we putting the incisal edge? Okay. Let's go do a couple of cases. This will become much clearer. So we visualize the solution. We do it through a mock-up. If you look here, we're looking at a wax up on the upper left. And we're also looking at digital design. The bottom line is whether you do it analog or digital, the digital gives tremendous advantage because of natural tooth power form and the ease of using facial aesthetics off of the computer. We mock that up in the patient's mouth and we want to show them what it looks like. That's what's important because it's an opportunity to create the theater, theater, excuse me for my Long Island accent, theater for the patient. And we create that theater for the patient by using video and lighting so that now we show them this video because if they hold up a mirror and look at this plastic in their mouth, it doesn't look great. But from a video with proper lighting or even an iPhone camera that uh, you, you show the patient, it works great. And you're looking for that wow. So let's choose the appropriate technique. Identify, visualize, choose the appropriate technique. Well, where do we start? That's the big question. In our practices, where do we start? And not only do I want to give you theory tonight in a short 45, 50 minutes, I want to give you practical things you can do when you go back to your dental practice. I was very fortunate to kind of come up with this idea and create with some amazing people, this company called Glow Science. And with that Glow Science, we figured out, hey, where does this start? And you know where it starts? It starts in the hygiene room. Because in the hygiene room where our existing patients are, we want to make sure that we can meet their needs. And we do it through also motivation, but we do it through taking a shade. Because we believe every patient is a potential whitening patient because everybody wants to have a beautiful smile. Well, if you believe that, and if you say every patient 
is a white, then it follows that not only is every patient a whitening patient, when they get motivated, we say, where are you now? And they pick their shade in the mirror together with the hygienist. And then we say, where do you want to go? And where you want to go, they normally go about five shades. If you have a whitening system that can get you five shades just about every time, you can now meet the needs of the patient. And we can transform these patients by meeting their needs because we believe if you look at that lower wheel, every patient is a whitening patient. Every patient then needs to be always upgraded with that whitening. So it's a touch up or now an old crown or, or worn teeth are really showing because they're now really looking at their smile. And today we know what that's like in the age of Zoom that everybody sees themselves. And the truth is that we have this opportunity to create smile transformation. So every patient is a whitening patient becomes every patient could be a a smile transformation patient, which opens up the whole opportunity and the funnel for aesthetic dentistry. And also, of course, for structure, function, and biology for health. So we take a motivational shade guide. There's Jen, who is now with the GLOW team, taking a shade with the patient. And she says, this is where I am, and this is where I want to go. And I'm going to get you there. Jen's going to do a whitening procedure. Now the patient is, is so excited and they're focused on the smile, which also drives the health of the mouth. And we know that when our patients get excited and they're motivated, everything else falls into place and why we start with aesthetics. So we take a proper shade on every patient at every hygiene appointment. We call it the motivational shade taking and we motivate them to imagine their smile potential. So to go over it, what we're able to do is at the hygiene appointment, we do multiple things, of course, but we do take the shade and it's a motivational shade taking to get them excited. And that then could become, and I'm gonna show you this case, actually a motivational mock-up as they say, well, I want the teeth bigger. I want to have a wider smile. And that can be any technique that, that, that is gonna get us there, but we can show the patient that. And the truth of the matter is that through great whitening techniques, and we believe at GLOW without sensitivity, we can do that. We can move uh, shades as much as 16 shades like this type one tetracycline case. So let's go back and let's go now look at clinical cases and see how this methodical approach and a systematic approach of three-step analysis allows us to move slow, gather the information, visualize it, show our patient, but not only show our patient, for them to wear the design and get them excited. So we're gonna talk about now and focus on a patient experience. We're also gonna talk about this motivational mock-up that's gonna get them there. So here's Diane, and you can take a look and see that she's worn her teeth. We use a lot of video because our technicians wanna see the action. What are the action of the lips? And we can see the vertical and the horizontal components of the smile. So we go through, and this is just a navigational bar that we use for case presentations at our program of the facial analysis, now camera zooming in, dental, facial, dental, and we go through all the important determinants to get to the point where we can have the analysis of where we are to identify the problem. We start with the effective question. I would change everything, the shape. If there was anything you could change, what would you change? She says everything. Then if I said to her, I said, well, if you have two categories, clean, healthy, natural, straight, wide, perfect, what do you want to do? She says, I want clean, healthy, natural. So now I know the shade I'm going to use for the mock-up, and I know that I'm going to try to create some type of offsets and rotations or incisal edge contour to drive that naturalness. Fantastic. So I've learned a lot just by asking those few questions. Let's go through some analysis and facial analysis. We look at the pupillary line, the incisal edge, parallelism. We look at midline. Is there symmetry? We look at profile view. And what's interesting is she had a a lot of wear. And you can see that wear on the front, but posteriorly a lot of wear. And what happens when there's, there's wear on the teeth, you'll get an auto rotation of the mandible and you end up getting this concave profile where the chin auto rotates. You have the, the upper lip, lower lip set back and that rickety plane, that profile view and the facial view is so critical to understand facially generated treatment plan. 
Because if the patient has a concave profile, in other words, lips are set back off that line, we want to make things bigger. We want to make things longer. We want to bring it back. Convex profile is we want to make things smaller. Remember, an central incisor can be 10 millimeters all the way up, depending on lip. And so you got to determine kind of how much exposure from a tooth shape position, tooth shape, excuse me, and a tooth to tooth position. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> so here she is with the lip at rest showing a, a millimeter. You can see a lot the, the wear. She's got um, what we call right a gummy smile, two to three millimeters. She's got a high smile line, reverse curve. And we go through all the dental facial thinking, not touching at the incisal ledge. Midline two millimeter off to the left. Okay. So what supports all of the singing, thinking is the fundamentals of aesthetics. And, and that can be under, cannot be underestimated. Uh, great books is uh, Rufinock's book, is Dawson's book, Gerard Sheesh's book. Um, we believe that we, 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 we did a, a nice job with our, our book uh, on integration of aesthetics, but this is where the learning is. It allows us to identify the problem, to understand the problems, ask those important questions, work with a great technical team, and, and visualize where we want to go. So let's, let's run that play right here. When you look at her occlusion, she had wear on the posterior teeth. She had some demineralization. So you figure out exactly where that's from. Is it a gastric reflux problem? Is it sucking on lemons? But a lot of wear on the lower anteriors and the max ants and a decent amount of wear. Not tremendous amount, but some wear. Okay. And now we get out to flowable because we're saying to ourselves, all right, she's got a high gum. We know that a high smile line, that this is a, basically an inviolate rule that you don't want to go greater than 10.5 millimeters, 10 millimeters on a high smile line patient because it throws off the balance on that lower third of the face. So we're measuring, we're at about 10.45 and we overlaid the gum line with some flowable. We created an incisal edge that when you put the lip down, it shows about two, at least two millimeters. We know from Big and Bruno's study, 30 year old woman shows three millimeters with the lip at rest, right? A 60 year old woman shows three millimeters of the lower teeth. There you go. So gravity takes over, everything goes, goes gravitationally south. So we want our 60 year old, Patients, they want to look 30 years old. How do we do that for them without giving them big teeth? Okay. So now we visualize where we want to go. We use flow, but we use that information and we put this into our mock-up. We take a bite registration and we look exactly how do we get a proper overbite over jet anteriorly. We can go into this at another time more detail. And that sets your occlusion because remember, she has a lot of wear and you have to create some space, minimal space for this overbite overjet relationship. From this, we do a diagnostic wax up. We like to start with a smile design because that's the theater. The theater is to excite the patient. After you excite the patient and they say, let's go, then the hard work begins because then we're doing more of the wax up. We're understanding which teeth need to be built up. Maybe a patient needs uh, implants, extractions, whatever structure function biology takes over. But we know from an incisal edge position and the lips and the face, where our overbite over jet is going, where that incisal edge, we call it that feline goes. So we, this is digital smile design. We take the facial pictures slightly open. We start doing the design of digital smile design software. And we get to a place where we use natural tooth form, proper gingival margin. We kind of figured that out from our flowable. So the, the design team knows that we're going for a 10.5 millimeter central. Here's the incisal edge. And here's the gingival margin. Now we want to mock this up into the patient's mouth. We want to get the patient really excited. So how do we do that? Here's an index for the mock-up. And there's the patient before. There she is smiling. And that's the mock-up in the mouth. Right? And she's not looking at self herself in the mirror at this point. This is just a mock-up was transferred from the 3D printed model. Okay, so. Wow. What did you say? Oh, look at you. Wow, I have teeth. Wow. 
my teeth were never that nice. Even before they were grinded, that's amazing. She's looking at herself. That video you saw before, she's watching that. And she says, wow. And when she says, wow, we say go. And that's now where the hard work begins because now we started with aesthetics first. Now we dive into structure, function, and biology. Okay. So basically, this is the 3D printed design. This is working off of the software, work with DSD, the amazing software that they, in fact, they have on, uh, on an iPad and they have it as an app. Other softwares you could look at too. But from this design, we're able to 3D print and we can make a surgical guide because we know exactly where the gingival margin is going from a facial aesthetic standpoint and we know where the incisal edge goes. There she is after healing. These are the provisionals, time tested provisionals. Everything is healing nicely. We wait the important time of six to eight weeks for gingival healing for predictability. And we're figuring out at this point exactly shapes of the teeth time-tested provisionals, what we say, the functional dress rehearsal. As we go through this process of a functional dress rehearsal, then it's just all your technique of taking beautiful impressions, working with a great team, and we get predictable final results. Over bite, over jet is the biological model, set up the posterior occlusion, did a crown replacement where we had to you know, do that for a slight opening in the vertical dimension to get the proper over bite, over jet. Predictable final results, very stable. And you can see the profile view. She lost about 20 pounds. She looks amazing. And uh, she always brings the joy when she comes to, the, to our practice. Great. Okay, let's go to another case. I want to try to get through two more if possible. Let's see how we run. Here's Alyssa. And Alyssa is a great patient to show you. This was a course that we did in my office, Dr. Christian Coachman and myself. And this is when we were just working on our digital workflow together. But this drives what we're if talking about. If you can have the perfect smile, what would it be? What would it look like? We we're talking words, adjectives we we're using. What we say? Adjectives. Um, white. White. Bigger teeth. Bigger teeth. Where would you want bigger teeth? Uh, in the front. Yeah. You okay? And how about the edge? We're going to get rid of some of that little bit of grayness you have at the edge? Yes. Right. Beautiful. Okay, and how about how about you enough. thought that there was a little bit gummy, right? Raise yeah. the gum line a little. Too gummy, for sure. A little too gummy. Yeah. Here. Right. And how important is a smile for you? Very important. Why is it important? Because I'm a model, so this is a money maker. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a model, and this is her money maker. This is everybody's different. Everybody's different. I looked at myself on Zoom and I got to improve my smile or my grandchildren or I got a wedding coming up. But the bottom line is we're capturing this moment and we're sharing this. If the technicians are not in our office, we get this video. If the technicians are in our office, we get this video. We want to capture our patients. We capture their personality. We learn so much by asking these effective questions. She told us everything. I want my teeth bigger. I want them wider. It's important. It's my money maker. Okay. So here she is, beautiful gal. And you can see that she's got a lot of great symmetry as a model. A right side of her face lines up beautifully to the left side. And you almost wouldn't even notice that she has small teeth, but it bothers her. She wants to have this more of a big dynamic uh, smile. When you look at the upper lip to the lower lip, that should be four and two. It's much bigger there. It's about eight. And, and about uh, four to five. So she has some concavity, which tells us we can build it out in relationship to her facial aesthetic when you look at that nasolabial angle and Richard's E plane. A month. 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 A so we know we don't have to lengthen anything. She's got three to four millimeters. So it's very youthful, but the teeth are narrow and small. So how are we going to change that? And we're going to keep digging in on gathering this information, going through our checklist approach, which takes no more than four or five minutes. Is it a high smile line? Is it the, is the curve of the incisal ledge parallel to that lower lip? Is it touching, not touching? And we go through this checklist to really get a feel for the facial, dental facial, and 
50. 50. 51. 51. 52. 52. 53. Share with our technicians and our team. Great. And then we look at our, our microesthetic elements. Is the axial, axial inclinations off? I don't have enough time here to go into a lot of detail of this, but we're looking at the height to width proportion. We know a central incisor, if it's 10 millimeters high, it's eight millimeters wide, it's an 80% ratio. So that gives an idea of where the gingival margin is and some of these asymmetries that she has, how do we improve it? So we're identifying the problems and then we're going to continue down this road. Got a height there of 9.7, 79%, very close to 80%. Now we look at occlusion, right? Working left, working protrusive, and we go through our occlusion and see where there might be some wear facets, some balancing and working site interferences, and, and really, is there wear on the teeth or abfraction, le abfractive lesions? Because we're always looking for what is, is there stress in the system? And, and you know, we have to play our dental detectives. Here's microesthetic elements. It's a lot of detail. I want to try to get through this, but I'm happy to share this with everybody. Um, and this is in detail in our book. Thank you. And then I like to draw in pictures also. And we now use uh, all kinds of great digital pads to, to, to do this. There's one called Remarkable, where you take a picture and you can draw in it. And we like to draw the teeth. But basically what we want to do from a sculpting standpoint, because we want to give whoever's doing the wax up, whether analog or digital, as much information as possible. The DSD requirements are actually gotten much easier from now, from this, but it's a retractor with a with slightly open and scanning the teeth, and now we can design the smiles. So we have new requirements for DSD. And here we are at the course. This is about probably four and a half, five years ago. And in fact, we're talking to Christian's brother who's in Madrid, and that's where they had the smile design. Since then, we now have our design in our own office and we have our digital designers working on smile design and aligners, but there's amazing software today to really get you excited that your team can be learning. All of our assistants were very fortunate, our dentists from foreign countries, and they really are very software savvy. So from an article from Coachman and Calamita is, is facially generated and cephalomatic guided 3D digital design. And they really have driven this concept of smile design so beautifully over the last 10 years. Once you have a design, you print, and then you create an index. There's a whole technique to create a very, very beautiful index. And then that's loaded with the resin, goes into the patient mouth for the oh, motivational yeah, mock-up. Last night, so. <laughs> Here, here's the motivational mock-up on Alyssa. And we're looking at this, and the teeth are much bigger. We actually, when we did the provisional, we made things a little bit smaller. We got feedback from her, but you can see there's much more of a dynamic smile. And everything's on video, and this was actually during the course, so we have some nice video on that. Fantastic. From the design, once we get a, a patient thumbs up, the wow result, excited, now we move forward with structure function and biology. Here we did some sculpting on the soft tissue and evening all the gum lines. And here's a, 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 a surgical stent that's derived from the design from the 3D printed model. So everything is designed from facial aesthetics. Once that is done, then we do an AP. Once that tissue is now in that perfect place after healing, we do an APT technique, which the index is put back into the mouth. You could read about this nicely in Galip Garel's book of porcelain veneers, the APT technique where we're prepping the design. And so we do minimally invasive dentistry that way. Here's the final preparations. You can see a little inflammation on the right lateral. There's the final preps. And there's the provisionals, time tested. There's the provisionals. There's the final case in black and white. There's the final case in color. You can see the nice symmetrical tissue. Fantastic, beautiful, soft tissue healing post-surgically. There we are with a happy patient. And she told me that a week later, she got a Crest commercial. Let's hear it for the team. She got the Crest commercial. All right, I got a few minutes. I wanna show you this case is really interesting because a lot of our patients are this. These are our patients who might be into their 50s and they wanna look much younger. We all wanna look much younger, me included. So we're looking at how do we start? And we start with our planning. And we do our planning with a methodical approach. 
identify the problems, visualize the solution, choose the appropriate technique, use a three-step analysis to get us there. We start measuring. And we're, we spend a lot of time now on the lips and the oral facial structures because us as dentists, we have this transdisciplinary approach. If the lip is too long, then there's an opportunity if you work with a plastic surgeon to move that lip back up. There's also lasers today that allow for collagen tightening to move that lip up. So we have tools at our disposal to not assume that where the lip is, where the patient walks in the day, in the door has to stay there because if that lip is long and we wanna show some tooth exposure and they got a high lip line when they smile, we're gonna have too long a tooth. So we wanna always constantly be building natural tooth forms. There she is with the motivational mock-up, big improvement. She came in to change one crown. I showed her this, she said, go, super excited, Nance. And then we did some measurement with the lip. And so I'm gonna show you what we ended up doing. With In mind that we were going to slightly move that lip up, we built a very natural tooth form. Here's the motivational mock-up. You can see the improvement. There she goes. And here's the final veneers. Her lip is still long and that's still an issue, but we brought this idea to her early on. And I worked very collaboratively with Dr. Oren Tepper. Oren's a plastic surgeon. He's uh, the sur plastic surgeon was part of the team that separated the conjoined twins at Montefiore, amazing plastic surgeon. And we develop uh, techniques to index exactly where we want the lip at the time of surgery. So we measure and we figured out, if you look at the first slide, we figure out exactly how much uh, lip movement we want to move up. We moved her up three millimeters so that the incisal edge is showing two to three millimeters, very youthful. You can see the appliance that she has in her mouth that actually supports the lip post-surgically also and acts as a surgical stent. So what we're able to do is that if you look at her before and if you look at her after veneers, and then if you look at her lip position, you see this whole perioral rejuvenation. This is exciting because the truth is that we don't, we, we don't want to work in a silo. We call it transdisciplinary as we bring our disciplines together. We bring our dental disciplines together, and we also bring our disciplines together with our medical colleagues and our plastic surgeons and whoever else we have to work with for the, the health and the beauty of our patients and for their smile. So here's your clinical takeaways. Aesthetics and functions are integrated together. They all meet at the incisal edge. And we call it the functional aesthetic edge or the feline. Diagnosis starts here. We say move slow to go fast. We use a three-step analysis, a methodical approach to identify where you are, visualize where you want to go, and choose the appropriate technique. This concept has been around for 40 years. Thank you, Dr. Peter Dawson. We create a systematic approach to diagnosis through a three-step analysis using the aesthetic evaluation form and visualizing using either an analog, but today let's go digitally because it's more effective and more efficient to facilitate our treatment plan. And remember, we choose the most minimally invasive treatment plan. And it's necessary to maintain our fundamentals always, regardless of whether we're working analog or digital. The digital revolution and smile design creates efficiency and effectiveness. And there's a learning curve. You get your scanner first, you work with laboratories that are designing, you then take it up another notch, you bring your team together, you invest in your people, you create an environment that people can thrive in as you're growing if you're a young dentist, you invest in your people and you put as much effort into your people as we put into our patients. It's all about the who and it's all about who we surround ourselves with and how we help people get to become those best versions of themselves. While I'm talking about the best versions of ourselves, I have to talk about this book called Ikigai. It's a wonderful book. Ikigai is the Japanese expression for raison d'etre, the reason, the purpose that we do what we do. And our purpose is to be our best version. So when passion, our passion for what we do, our mission in life, our profession, and what we get paid for all merge together, when that all comes together, the Japanese says it's your ikigai. It's a wonderful read. I leave you with a couple of great books that I've always loved over the years. 
Emotional Intelligence, which is an amazing book on leadership and communication. E-Myth Revisited, amazing book by Michael Gerber. EOS, which is the Entrepreneurial Operating Systems. Know this as dentists, dentists, owners. We are all entrepreneurs. We are all have to understand the business side, the communication side, the leadership and the management side of what we do. That's why books like EOS and Traction are must-reads. And the concept of moving slow to go fast, MVP, testing ideas. I tell you, go check out Eric Reese and the Lean Startup. Let me leave you with this thought. Let's make believe a stranger is on an elevator with you and asks, what do you do for a living? It's up to you to know how to respond. You may say, I'm a dentist. Or you may say, I transform people's lives by bringing their most beautiful smile to life. Together, we will help inspire our profession to meet the needs of the 21st century, challenge the status quo, to drive disruption and reinvention. And that's what I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with that thought, what do you do for a living? And if you say, I transform people's lives, that's what we do, that's what I do, and that's what we do with my team. That concept of reinvention, of, of the beauty of the profession that we're in and how exciting it is today with our new technology and the ability to build our business in a way that allows us to be best versions of ourselves and drive the purpose of what we do. Okay, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to present this material to you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We've got a couple minutes left for questions. If anyone has them, drop them in the Q&A or chat. Uh, one question we did get is, what, what, what does the timeline look for everything that you explained today? What's the timeline look like? Well, the timeline, um, it depends on structure, function, and biology, right? If it's um, a clinical situation where you're figuring out in sizeledge position, Maybe um, the patient wore down her front teeth, did not change vertical dimension. Her occlusion is good, not too much wear on the back teeth, more of a kind of simple situation. Then it's the ability to visualize where you want to go. Uh, you can do that analog or digital, show the patient, get that exciting motivational mock-up, videotaping. And we use the lights just like we use in Zoom now, proper lighting, show the patient that video. So once they say go, then however long it takes you from start to finish to, let's say, doing veneers or changing out crowns, you know, that's that type of scenario. Another scenario is when there's periodontal work or crown lengthening or implants, the amount of time it takes for biology, structure and function to, to kind of heal will determine the timing outcome. So we can go from literally two weeks to do some of these situations to could take all the way up to nine months to a year if there's extraction and grafting and implant placement to, su to support uh, um, the occlusion. So, you know, it, it goes back to, uh, it, it depends on the clinical situation. Uh, another question we got here, where can we get the Smile Veal form and or book? Yeah, so uh, on Amazon, it, Smile Design Integration of Aesthetics Occlusion, look under my last name, uh, L -E -V -I -N -E. Uh, it, it is on Amazon, um, and the, the publisher is Elsevier. Cool. And then we got a, a positive comment here from Mary that says, I love Glow and use it on all my patients. Great product that gives excellent results. Great to hear. So Great to hear. Cool. Uh, let's see one more. I know you do everything in the office for us. Where do you send the digital? Yeah. So if you're interested to learn more about this digital, it, I, I would ask you to go to DSD, digitalsmiledesign.com. They have amazing teaching seminars, both online and soon once we get out of this craziness of COVID-19, they have uh, great, great lectures and seminars and residency type programs. Um, in the United States, they work out of Miami. Um, otherwise you can jump a plane and go to Madrid or Sao Paulo with Dr. Coachman, his brother Francis, and the whole team of Digital Small Design, a wonderful group of people that take these concepts, really break it down in modules so you can really learn you know, in a very nice stepwise approach. Excellent. Well, with that, I think we'll wrap for the evening. So thank you, Dr. Levine, for your time today. If anyone has additional questions about this topic, feel, uh, please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we'll be happy to connect you with Dr. Levine. 
Additionally, if anyone is interested in attending future Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. As a thank you for attending tonight, everyone will receive the recording via email sometime in the next week. Thank you all for attending, and we look forward to seeing you back here soon. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you.